Hello, is this working? Yeah. Hi, it's very bright here. Um, good morning. Is it still morning? I think it is. Uh, so we're going to talk about the state of Kubernetes development tooling and about another thing which I find very amusing, which is uh, bits and pieces of wisdom that I picked up along the way. Like Kubernetes the hard way falsely implies that there is an easy way. Uh, so I'm going to share some of those. Um, so why this talk? Uh, I'm going to talk about Kubernetes development tooling, as you have guessed from the title. And the good thing about development tooling is uh, that there's a lot of it. And the bad thing about development tooling for Kubernetes is that there is a lot of it. There's too much of it. As you can see by this picture, this is the CNCF landscape. Kubernetes is a tiny speck on the corner here, uh, and there's so much stuff in the space. And especially if you're trying to, you know, just write your code and get your stuff to run, uh, it can be very overwhelming. And I hope to remove some of that overwhelm and help you make sense of things. So this is a talk that was originally made for developers. So uh, people are writing code all day. Uh, I realize this is a DevOps conference, so you're probably the people who make sure that your developers can uh, write code all day as opposed to the people actually doing that. Uh, but this applies nonetheless. So this is a talk for people who are working on applications that run on Kubernetes, but you're not writing code for Kubernetes itself. So if you're making CRDs, operators, that kind of thing, I'm probably not going to be of much help. Uh, if you're writing your own application for your own business logic of your company, uh, something like that, and it's just meant to run on Kubernetes, then these tools are going to help you. You are the developers on your team. I keep speaking to developers, but this is a DevOps conference. Um, so I'm going to talk about tools that exist in the pre-commit stage. So the part of the day where code gets written, the part of the day where developers are, you know, writing uh, words and tokens and weird little symbols on their IDEs and code editors and Vim or Emacs. Let's not get into that. Uh, and I'm not going to talk about CI, CD, um, uh, what's, the, what's that word? Uh, provisioning and that kind of thing. I'm mostly going to talk about the development part of the workflow. So more wisdom here. Um, so there's a bunch of different things that you have to do when you're writing an application, when you're creating an app, uh, or whatever kind of tool you, you're working with. And I'm not going to talk about some of them, like I just mentioned. Um, and within the ones that are left, I've split them into a few categories. So the categories that we're going to look at are, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about configuration files, about bootstrapping. And bootstrapping is the name I've given to tasks. For example, if you need to populate a database before you can uh, run your application, uh, that's a bootstrapping task. If you need to populate a database with tables, I mean. Uh, then there is the development proper part of the cycle, where you write your code, you build a new container, you push it to your dev cluster, uh, and then the feedback part, where you see uh, if the change that you made actually worked, if your tests are passing, uh, then you have to debug, and how do you debug? Are you going to use a bunch of print lines in your code, and that's the debugging strategy, or are you going to use an actual debugger, but suddenly your process is running inside the container and not uh, on your computer, so how do you attach a debugger there? So these are some questions we're going to talk about. When I started preparing this talk, I had a wish list of what is the ideal development workflow when I'm writing an app that's going to run Kubernetes. And I had a lot of things that I wanted. And so I want to share with you this wish list very briefly. And later, we can discuss what we achieved out of this. So I want applications, I want tools that use small config files because I'm so done with Kubernetes manifests that are five kilometers long and I don't care about half the options. Uh, if, some, uh, if some tool creates config files for me or makes it so that I don't need config files, that is great. 
bootstrapping tools I just mentioned. I want to be able to do setup tools um, like I just talked about. Uh, sorry, setup tasks like I just talked about. Uh, and then there is the part of the day where I write code. So I don't want to have to go uh, Docker build, Docker push, kubectl apply every time I make a change to my code. I don't want to do that by hand. That's just silly. So I want tooling to do that for me. I want a short feedback loop. So I recently ran a poll on Twitter about how long does it take your code when you make uh, when you change one line of code. How long does it take for that change to be running in your development cluster? I got about 2,000 answers. I think half of them were like, just show me the results and they didn't really vote. But the other 1,000 uh, were split between 40% said it took them 30 minutes or more. 40% uh, said it took them uh, five minutes or more. And the remaining uh, said that it took them like five seconds. And I think everyone can get to five seconds. We don't need to be waiting five minutes or half an hour to see changes to our code. And that really stops uh, the thought process uh, when you when you're writing your code and suddenly you have to wait half an hour. When you get back to it, you don't remember what you were doing anymore. So I don't want that. And we're going to talk about tools that make it so that you don't have to wait that long. I want tools that don't stand in my face, so they're unobtrusive. Uh, I want tools that are easy to onboard, uh, new team members on. And I want tools that where I can write down dependency relationships so that I can specify if one service has some relationship to another service, I should be able to tell my system that. Uh, testing, I'm going to talk about very briefly because there's not much in the way of tooling that helps you with testing. Uh, we're all familiar with CI and how it does things and how it takes forever to do testing and how we all hate that. I'm going to talk a little bit about a solution to that, but there's not much tooling in this space so far, which I'm sad about and working on. Uh, and finally, debugging. Uh, well, debugging is the first category, so we're just going to get into that, and I'm not going to describe it here and describe it again in two minutes. This is one of my favorites. Uh, OK, so I split the tools that we're going to talk about in three categories. So the first category is debugging, and it's a very small category. Then there's a bunch of Unix-style tools. And Unix-style, I mean that philosophy of every tool should do just one thing and do it well. So we're going to talk about some of those tools. And then there's a category I'm, talk I'm calling build and deploy, which are tools that basically have a project awareness. They see everything you're doing, and they do a bunch of stuff for you, and you don't have to think about them or wire them together. And that's my favorite category. Category, and we're going to talk about that last because we need some background before we get there. So we're going to talk. These are the tools we're going to talk about. Uh, it's a lot of them, so it's going to be brief. I'm not going to give you a, a huge overview of every tool. I'm just going to tell you a little bit about them, and if you like them, you're going to have to Google it. Uh, and there are so many tools that we're not going to talk about, and I'm going to wait for all the pictures. <laughs> There are so many tools we're not going to talk about. And in fact, it's funny that there are so many tools in this area that one of these tools is not a real tool. I just made up a bunch of letters. And I've given, I've presented this talk probably 10 times this year. And only once did someone actually know all the tools and pointed out to me, this one is not a real tool. Only once. So out of thousands of people who saw this, only one could pick that out. So kind of goes to, to the point that there's too much stuff and we need help navigating this, this field. Uh, happy five years for Kubernetes. And OK, so debugging. Now let's get to the first tool. Uh, KubeCuddle, if you don't know, uh, that's the logo for KubeCuddle. It's a cuttlefish. It's terrifying. I hate it. <laughs> Uh, so kubectl is the first debugging tool that you need to look at. It might be the last one, depending on how good you are with kubectl. It's a very powerful tool and a tool that also takes a boatload of work to learn. There are certificates like CKAD, which is Certified Kubernetes Application Developer. Uh, it's a whole certificate. It's basically totally based on using kubectl. So <clears throat> there's a lot of stuff here. I I suggest you at least look at the kubectl uh, cheat sheet that's on the kubernetes.io website, just so you know everything that it can do, and then you know what to look for uh, when you need it. Uh, but the thing about kubectl is I have worked at, uh, I, I had an internship. I was writing code full-time for kubectl for a few months. 
And I like kubectl. It's a good tool. It does a lot of stuff. It's really powerful. But every time a developer who's writing code needs to stop writing their code to play with kubectl, I get sad because it's like going to the kitchen to get some water. And before you can get some water, you need to go under the sink and fix the plumbing. To me, that's, that's what, kube, what using kubectl uh, during, the, during development means. And I don't like it. And hopefully, as, uh, as an ecosystem, we can get away from developers having to, to know this. But right now, that's not reality. So every developer should know a little bit about kubectl. And I think the bare minimum is this one command that I've outlined there. What that does is it streams logs uh, from a container. Uh, it basically tells you uh, all the standard out and standard error from a container goes to your uh, terminal. Uh, and that makes it so that if you're using a print line debugging technique, basically fill your code with print lines and that's it, uh, that at least you can see those print lines and know what's going on. So if you're going to take nothing from the debugging section here, uh, at least this, this is the one thing to, to look into. Uh, this is one of those doc one of the documents you should read. Uh, I'm going to get you the link afterwards. Uh, I think every developer should at least take a brief look at this. Uh, it has some basic debugging techniques. Uh, but moving on, let's say you don't like uh, print line debugging. Uh, you like to use an actual debugger. But hey, suddenly my code's running in a container. How do I attach a debugger to that? Uh, and so there's Squash. Uh, Squash is a really cool tool. It lets you uh, attach uh, a debugger to a process running in a container, which is very handy. It's especially handy that you can do it to multiple containers at a time. And you can have, uh, you can step through the code, you can attach breakpoints, uh, you can do set breakpoints. What's the verb here? You can set breakpoints and all of that. And so the cool thing is you can have multiple process, you can have, for example, two services running and they're talking to each other. You can attach a debugger to both and you can see uh, line by line going through your code as one talks to the other. That's really powerful, but kind of complicated. Uh, so if that's something you want to do, then you can do it with Squash. And if, if that's your thing, then that's your thing. Here's what it looks like. So you start Squash, uh, you choose your debugger. Here I'm using Delve, which is the debugger for Go. Set a namespace, choose a pod, uh, and at the end here, if you have ever used uh, a debugger before, uh, I can't point it there because there's a thing on the way. Um, if you've ever used a debugger, at the end I'm setting a breakpoint, uh, so if you've ever used a debugger, uh, you can take it from here and you know how this works. Okay, next tool. Let's say you looked into Stern and it's really too complicated and GDB is scary. You don't want to use that. Let's just stick to print lines. Uh, but now you have print lines in 10 different microservices that you need to keep an eye on and that is uh, too much. So if you do it the normal way, you need to type this command on 10 terminals at the same time. So that is just, no, that's just too inelegant. So you should use Stern. Stern is going to stream logs from multiple pods uh, or containers. It's going to stream them. Uh, it's going to be color coded so you can tell which is which. Uh, it's all going to go into one window. You can filter it using, I think, regex, uh, regex blobs. Uh, it's really, it's really lightweight. Uh, I, it used to be that whenever I would, was doing anything at all Kubernetes related, I would always have Stern running so I could see what was going on. That is not, no longer the case. I'm going to tell you why a little bit later. But Stern is a really good tool that I think everyone working with Kubernetes should uh, be familiar with. This is what it looks like uh, here. These are logs, I think, from a neural networks talk that I did. Uh, so you can see it's three separate services. You can get logs from all of them on the same screen, color coded. You get the name of the pod there. So it's pretty handy. OK, now let's go to Unix style tools. They're tools that do one thing and do one thing well, hopefully. So the first one is Helm. Helm and kubectl, they have their own category that I'm going to mention later, which is stuff that you just have to learn, or basically there is no escape. Just just learn it. Just You can't get away. Like kubectl and Helm, you are going to have to learn both of them. Uh, so I'm not even going to talk too much about Helm. Just know that if you're not familiar with Helm, you need to do your homework, Google it, learn it. Uh, so Helm is a package manager for Kubernetes. It allows you to, for example, do Helm install WordPress, and poof, it suddenly installs uh, your database, it installs the WordPress app itself, uh, and it's like, it's like NPM or, uh, uh, what's it called, Gems or Brew, APT. Uh, it's basically a normal package manager. And some people use it for development, which I'm not a big fan of. 
uh, and some people use it to deploying to production, which then I'm actually a big fan of. Uh, and the problem with using it for development is that it's a bit clunky. It was not really made for that. So we're going to look into better tools uh, soon. But you should know that you need to learn about Helm. Uh, and this shouldn't come as news to many of you. Now, this is a really nifty little tool, Inlets. Uh, it's a reverse proxy and WebSocket tunnel to expose internal endpoints to the internet. So if you've ever used Endgrok, uh, it's basically the free and open source version of that. Uh, it's really good for basically two things. One is when you need to share uh, what you're doing um, maybe in a local cluster uh, on-prem that is not exposed to the internet or a local cluster running on your laptop, you need to expose that to the internet to share your work with someone. So it's very useful for that. It's also very useful when you're developing stuff like webhooks, where you need your development thing, your thing that is not production ready, that is not really in the real world, you need that to be able to receive requests or connections from the internet, from outside. So Inlets is very cool for that as well. Uh, of course, you're exposing stuff to the internet that's not meant to be exposed to the internet, so uh, red teamers and all the security teams are going to be very happy with you because you're not going to do your homework when it comes to security, so you should be mindful of that. But when you need it, it's there. Uh, here's roughly how it works. You basically take uh, an exit node somewhere uh, on the internet and you run a server there, uh, an inlet server. It's going to connect to a client that you're then running internally and it's going to make a tunnel between them. So it's not, it's not uh, you know, rocket science, but it's extremely handy and it works really well. And unlike Ngrok, uh, Inlet has a Kubernetes operator. So if you're running stuff on Kubernetes, it's very easy to install and set it up. Uh, so that is really cool. Moving on, k-sync. So sometimes when you're developing, uh, you make a change to something and you create, uh, am I making this noise? Probably, right? Oh boy. Wait. There you go. Now it's going to shut up. Um, so sometimes when you're developing, uh, you make a change to something and then you build a new container, you push that container to your registry, you reapply that uh, to your Kubernetes cluster. That's a lot of work. Sometimes when you're developing, uh, you just want to change one file. So, I don't know, maybe I changed the CSS file and I just want to refresh and see what it looks like. You don't want to build a whole container for that. So you can use ksync and what it does, it, it takes a deployed container that's already up and running and it establishes a file syncing thing. I don't know if it's rsync or whatever it is in the background. It does some kind of file syncing. There's a button here that I keep pressing. If everything explodes, it's this. Uh, <laughs> uh, so I don't know how it works in the background, actually, uh, but it syncs a local file system running on your computer with the file system of a container running on the cluster. So let's say you're using, um, I don't know, you're using JavaScript, you have Nodemon running, it's watching uh, your source code, uh, and that's running in a container. You can simply sync uh, some change you made to your source code in your computer that is going to instantly sync with the change that, uh, it's going to instantly sync with the file system in the container. In the container, you're going to have something watching for change changes. It's going to rebuild and uh, restart the process. And basically, you have a free live update right away. This is so annoying. What if I just keep it like this? Um, anyway, that is casing. Uh, all right, next one. And this is going pretty fast. I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, cube forward. So with, with cube cuddle, uh, you can do port forwards, which is basically, oh, hey, there is an endpoint on this container. Uh, I want to access this from my machine. Uh, you can do that. You have to do them one at a time. If you have 15 services and you want to just have access to everything, you need to do that for all of them. Uh, but it also, you can't access it using the host name that it had in, this, in, the, in, the, in your cluster. So for example, here, if you look at the bottom part, I have a bunch of host names there that only exist inside the cluster. And let's say I'm, develop, I'm writing a new service, I'm writing some prototype thing, and I want to access things with those actual names. Uh, I can't do that from my machine. Uh, well, now you can. 
So that is what uh, Cube Forward does for you. It changes a bunch of stuff in your host file, so you need root access, so some developers are not going to be able to use it, uh, but if you can, it's very handy. So it's great for when you're, uh, like I said, developing a new service or something like that, and you need access to stuff as if you were inside the cluster, kind of. Uh, and it's also great when some crazy API is going wrong, and you want to, for example, run Postman that you have on your machine and send it a bunch of weird-ass queries that you were not supposed to be able to, but you want to because you want to see what happens. Uh, so that is good for that as well. So I'm putting this as in between like a development tool and a debugging tool, let's say, in the categories that we had here. Uh, I, I find that a lot of people end up using it more as a debugging tool than a development tool per se. Uh, but anyway, now you know it's there. So Octeto, of all the tools uh, in this talk, Octeto is probably the one I know the least about. What I know is that it's very similar to Telepresence, which we're going to talk about next. So I'm just going to talk about Telepresence. And if you find out that you really want to use Telepresence, you should just look at Octeto as well, because it might fit your use case. That's all I can tell you. So telepresence. Uh, let's, let's do a little game here. Imagine you have uh, every service in your cluster is a little box here, and every box is, con is uh, connected to the, other box by a to the other boxes by a bunch of wires. So what telepresence does is you take away the box, you take all the wires, and you plug them into your computer, basically. So it's going to proxy all the network activity uh, in and out of that pod, uh, or deployment, I forget what's the unit of work of telepresence, don't know if it's pod or deployment, but it hot swaps, uh, it, it proxies all the networking in and out of that pod or deployment, I don't know, uh, into a process or a shell running in your computer. So for example, you can run bash uh, with telepresence and you can say all the networking in and out of this process, this bash thing, it's going to be actually the networking that was in that pod in the container. So basically you hot swap a pod or a deployment with a thing that's running on your machine. And that makes it so that, like, you're, for example, you had version 1 of a service uh, running in your cluster. Now you have version 2 that you're developing. And it's running as a process on your laptop. It's not in a container, not anything. Just a process on your laptop. Um, and you want, of course, that to be able to connect to all of your other services uh, and to be able to have the other services connect to it, uh, which is actually a thing that Cube Forward doesn't do. So Cube Forward, you can connect to the things. The things cannot connect to you. With telepresence, it's bidirectional, so that's cool. Uh, and then, yeah, then you can do that. And, yeah, so basically you get all the connectivity as if you were inside the cluster, but it, the process is running on your computer. Uh, so... You can use your local ID for development. You can use local debuggers and, and, and stuff, so all of that. Uh, before you ask, if, if I can use a debugger uh, with telepresence running locally, why would I use Squash? Squash, the debugging thing. Because with Squash, you can attach multiple things at a time. And with telepresence, you can only do this network switching thing uh, for one thing at a time. It's not going to let you run two instances on the same machine. So if you want to, you know, have three services and debug all three of them together or some crazy stuff like that, uh, you're going to need Squash. You can't use Telepresence. So Telepresence is more for uh, development and Squash is really uh, for debugging. So now we're going to, next, we're going to talk about two tools that are dead. They're not under development, but they set a history for the, the next category that is the one I'm most excited about. So Forge is dead. It's not under development. No one, no one, well, people still use it, but no one's working on it anymore. So it came out uh, some time ago. It was a predecessor to a bunch of tools that exist now. Uh, you can think of it as a very fancy shell script that does Docker build, Docker push, kubectl apply. So this is great because you shouldn't have to do those things by hand because they're annoying. Uh, but that's all it did. It was just uh, basically a script that would do all those things. It didn't watch your files. It didn't. Uh, let me. It didn't watch your files for changes. It didn't track dependencies. It didn't do tests. It didn't do anything. It just did that, which is cool. Uh, and this is going to be an integral part of the tools we're going to look at next. Yeah. Uh, okay, so this is the category that I'm really excited about and that I really wanted to get to. Uh, the first tool, again, it's dead. It's not under development. Uh, if you look at the uh, fourth bullet point here, this came straight from uh, Microsoft, from people in their team on Slack. Uh, we're not working on this. We're not going to work on this. We're working on Helm 3 and other stuff. So 
Don't use draft is what I'm saying. Uh, but I'm going to talk about it because it is a predecessor to the next tools. So build and deploy. What do I mean by build and deploy? All of these tools, what they do is you're writing code. Uh, you have a bunch of services. They are in a bunch of separate folders or whatever. Uh, every time you make a change to a file, they are going to uh, rebuild uh, and redeploy whatever that file belonged to. So you have, uh, I don't know, your database interface, whatever service, you change a line of code. Uh, any of those tools can uh, rebuild uh, that container, uh, redeploy that container, push it to your cluster, and everything is up and running, and you can see the changes right away. So uh, basically, uh, the, the feedback loop, the time in between you changing the code and you uh, seeing the change, it's going to be how long your, your Docker build takes uh, and how long it takes to push the image. So uh, in, in this workflow, you're not supposed to involve CI. Uh, CI comes based, I, I like to think of it like this. Uh, you involve CI after you know the code works, after you've done all the things and you see, oh, okay, this is good, this, uh, this is done, I've tested it, I've seen it in action, and I'm gonna push it to, to you know, whatever I want to push it to. Um, but you shouldn't have to be pushing stuff and waiting for CI while you are testing if the code works and trying to just, you know, uh, come up with an idea or something, something like that. Uh, something that all of these tools can also do, except for draft, is do hot reload. So hot reload is basically what K-Sync did. So when you change something, you don't want to rebuild an image because that takes too long. You just want to sync a file uh, from your local file system into the container, and then something happens in the container and you can see the file change. So all of these tools can do either rebuild or hot reload, except for draft. Um, Okay, so now I'm going to tell you, now that you know what all of these tools do, I'm going to tell you about the highlights, about what is special about each of these. So Draft, uh, it was really cool when it came out because I think it was the first tool that actually did this. It was annoying because it did so per module, not per project. So if you had 10 microservices, you'd have to run Draft 10 times, and then you would write a bash script to do it for you, and then we're back into JavaScript, uh, into bash script jungle world, which we don't like. Uh, and so yeah, uh, it, would, uh, it would generate config files for you, which was great, and I'm going to show you in a second. Uh, it did support bootstrapping tasks, so that thing where, oh, I need to populate the database with tables before this service goes up, it did allow you to do that, so it was fun. Um, and it's too bad that they're not uh, developing it anymore because it had a really, really promising uh, beginning, I think. So this is what it looks like. Uh, I start out, if you look at the top, I just have my, my source code and a config file. And I say, hey, Draft, create some config for me. And then if you look a few lines down, now I have a Docker file. I have a Helm chart that I can use to apply it to my cluster. Uh, and I didn't have to pay to create uh, those config files. I didn't have to write them myself. So that's really helpful. Then I can do draft up and draft connect, and I have hello world, uh, which is what my application code actually does. Uh, so this was really handy, uh, really cool, uh, way back in the, you know, a billion years ago, which is probably like two years ago in Kubernetes time or something. Uh, and all right, but like I said, draft is not being maintained anymore. Uh, it's pretty old stuff. Basically, we don't use that anymore. So I'm going to show you what's in use nowadays. So Garden, I used to work at Garden. I worked there until like two weeks ago. Um, so it's kind of funny because I created this talk when I was working at Garden. Now I'm working for Tilt, the company at the bottom of the list, which creates an in interesting conflict of interest. Uh, and I, uh, I actually had to ask Garden to allow me to use this talk now that I'm working for Tilt, and it was kind of an interesting discussion. So I'm going to try and be unbiased, and of course it's not going to work, but I'm going to try, but you know, now you know that it's not going to work, so it's on you. <laughs> so uh, the interesting things about Garden as opposed to the category in general. One is, uh, with Garden sometimes, uh, Garden has a bunch of different modules that do different things. Uh, in one of them, you don't need Kubernetes manifests. For the other tools here, you always need your Kubernetes YAML. Garden, sometimes, depending on what you're doing, it can generate your Kubernetes YAML for you. So basically, if you're doing the same thing that you're always doing, and it's a conventional workflow and that kind of thing, you don't need to write your Kubernetes YAML. That's really cool. I love it. 
another thing that Garden does is it allows for in-cluster builds. So you don't need Docker on your computer. You don't build images. You don't have to build images on your computer. You can just say, hey, cluster, do all this shit for me. I don't want Docker on my machine. Uh, so that's really cool. Uh, it can also track build and deploy and task dependencies. And I'm going to show you that uh, in a minute in a more visual way. And one thing that I really, really like about Garden is that it has tests as a first-class citizen. So this tool, uh, it has basically three main primitives. Uh, it builds, it deploys, and it tests. The other tools usually just have build and deploy. So this one has tests, which is really cool. And uh, so we're going to take a look at that more visually now. And I'm going to talk about the downsides of Garden later when I'm doing the comparison between all of them. Uh, so this is the Garden CLI. Uh, what it's doing here, basically, I have an application that I have already built and deployed, and I'm running the Garden CLI again. Uh, it's a bit hard to see, I'm sorry, but what's happening is basically it's checking, is all this stuff already built? Yes. Is all this stuff already deployed? Yes. Uh, do, I have, uh, do I have to run any tests, or are all my tests uh, already cached? And they are al already cached in this screenshot, so that's really cool. Uh, and this test thing is really what I like the most about Garden, is how it treats tests like that. And it caches tests, and it has a dependency system. So basically, whenever you make a change to your code, it only runs the tests that are related to the code that you changed. So it's really fast. You don't have to wait for, like, to run your whole test suite like you do with CI, and then it takes half an hour, because you only run a, few, a fraction of those every time. Uh, it's really fast. Uh, it has a dashboard. These are your services. Uh, and this is the dependency graph. So basically here, um, which side should I go to? to I'm going to come to this side, and I'm going to go to that side. So it's really cool that every task it has is a node here. So you have build tasks, you have... Um, deploy tasks, and you have test uh, tasks. And you can play around with that node, and you can see when things break. For example, um, if a task breaks, one of those things is going to turn red, and you can see it right away, and that's really cool. And uh, you have a lot of control, let's say, in that sense. Garden's not really... It doesn't make it easy to write plugins to make to, to extend what this does, uh, but it's really interesting that it's there. We're going to talk more about this in a second. Okay, so I'm going to go to the next tools now, and we're going to come back to this in a minute. So, uh, Jenkins. Uh, if you know Jenkins, you know that it does something, something provisioning. It does something, something CI. It does something, something I don't care about. Uh, basically, in this talk, I'm talking about development workflow. Jenkins does a bunch of stuff that are not development workflow, so I'm not going to talk about them. Uh, and when it comes to the, to the build and deploy tool, when it comes to that part, it basically uses scaffold and case sync. So case sync we already talked about, and scaffold we're going to talk about next. So I'm not going to get into Jenkins. Uh, the only reason I'm mentioning it is because, of course, if I didn't mention it, everyone would raise their hands afterwards and say, hey, you didn't mention Jenkins X. Uh, so it has a really cool feature, which are build packs. Uh, they generate config files for you, kind of like draft used to do. I haven't tested it myself, so and I've been presenting this talk all year and saying, oh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll look into this later, but really I won't, so maybe you should. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, basically what Jenkins X can do for you is what Scaffold and Casing can do for you. So I'm just going to talk about those two. And I would really say that only really consider Jenkins X if you're actually invested in the Jenkins uh, ecosystem, because then you might get some benefits out, out of there. Otherwise, uh, not really. So next, uh, scaffold. The first thing I want to say about scaffold is do not use scaffold because it's ugly. And the next tool on the list, Tilt, does everything that scaffold does, and it's pretty. There's more to it, but let's uh, discuss it further. The reason I'm talking about scaffold is because everything I'm going to say about scaffold applies to the next tool. So it already does you know, two jobs in one. So scaffold is a very focused tool. It does uh, what it does, basically only with no extras. What it does is it does the build and deploy thing that I described in the beginning. It does that very well with no, no extras, basically. It's very fast. Uh, it works really well. And it doesn't give you much um, 
a headache or new concepts to learn. Basically, if you already have your Docker file and your Kubernetes manifest, it's going to be extremely easy to set up. It works like a charm. Uh, you make a change, it updates, that's it, end of story. So it's really good. A lot of people use it. I suspect a lot of people who use it use it because it comes from Google and that gives it some credibility, although it's not the best tool on the list. <clears throat> and it doesn't do dependencies, tests, bootstrapping, none of that, uh, which is a shame, but it's also its uh, power because one of the things about Scaffold is it's pretty simple and pretty easy to set up. Uh, when we talk about Garden, for example, it does a boatload of stuff, but it has a very steep learning curve to set all of that stuff up, which Scaffold doesn't. So that's cool. Uh, but my main issue with Scaffold is it's not very pretty. I mean, it, it's clearly designed by engineers, um, which is not a compliment. So what's happening in the screenshot, at the beginning I run Scaffold, it does a bunch of build stuff, you can see uh, the typical output from building a, con a container image, then it deploys it to a container, hello world. I make a change to the file, it does the whole thing again, and now we have hello world with two exclamation marks now, I know, yeah, applause. Uh, anyway, uh, this is Scaffold. So if you're thinking of using Scaffold, you shouldn't just use Tilt, company I work for. To be fair, I was saying this before I ever considered working at Tilt, okay? You can see previous versions of this talk. Um, so it has the best looking UI, dashboard, logging. Uh, the team really focuses a lot on usability. Um, you can think of some of those tools compared to Tilt as being the, you know, the 10 years ago Mac versus PC kind of thing. Uh, it's like, yeah, the other tools sometimes have some extra features, but Tilt really makes it easy to use and makes you want to use them and it becomes a part of your workflow uh, and that's really cool. Uh, so all of Scaffold's uh, concepts basically map almost directly to Tilt. Anything Scaffold can do, Tilt can do. Garden has a few extras, the other two don't, don't really matter. Um, it does require Kubernetes manifests, which is its main drawback compared to Garden, in my opinion, and it's something I'm working on. Um, so even when you're doing the same thing you always do, you still need to copy over that manifest from your other project and s switch a few options there. And of course, you're going to forget one, so it's going to fail the first time, so you need to fix it again. And we should just automate that, and hopefully we will. Um, what I love the most about Tilt, besides the whole usability thing and the fact that it's really slick and really nice, is that it uses Starlark for its config files. Now, I am sure you have never heard of Starlark in your life, except for Yana here who works for Google and maybe saw it when using Bazel. Uh, <laughs> Sorry? No, go ahead. Oh, okay. Well, she knows the person who designed it, so. There you go. Um, so Starlark is basically, in a nutshell, it's a different flavor of Python. So it is, it is a programming language. It's a full language. You can do all kinds of crazy stuff with it. Uh, and what's cooler is that, what's coolest is that you can create functionality uh, in Tilt, in the Tilt config file, that was not meant to be there because everyone else uses YAML, which is kind of a flat config, and Tilt uses Starlark, which is, it, you can use it as a flat config with just a few options, or you can make it do all kinds of crazy stuff. So the other day, someone came along, and I, was, I just mentioned Bezo, because that's where uh, Starlark uh, originated, I think. But uh, actually, someone uh, uh, came on the GitHub repo and said, oh, hey, I wrote this thing so that you can integrate Tilt with uh, the Bezo build system. Uh, and the whole team was like, we never knew this was possible. How did you do this? And of course, because Starlark is an actual language, people can write their own crazy stuff on top of Tilt, uh, which were, were not, was not basically created by the company. Um, but that makes it so that people can use their creativity and create stuff, uh, adapt to needs that they have that we did not predict. Uh, there's a snapshots feature for team collaboration that I'm going to show you in a more visual way. Uh, the dependency tracking in Tilt is a bit different from Garden. So when you're tracking dependencies between services, the main uh, use for them really is uh, so that you know that you have to build and deploy this thing before that thing, else it's going to break. So Tilt does it, dependency tracking for the initial deploy, but it doesn't keep track of things afterwards. So Garden's going to have some advantages in that regard, but of course it also has a drawback. 
back that you have to set the whole thing up, while with tilt you don't really, it's a lot easier to set up. Uh, tilt is in use uh, by some very, very, very large teams. Uh, and I joined the company two weeks ago, so I couldn't manage to get authorization in time to mention those teams by name. If you follow my work in the upcoming months, uh, I will probably talk about them publicly, but right now I can't. So you just have to trust me that a lot of brand names that you would recognize are using Tilt in their development teams right now. So uh, this is what the CLI tool looks like. Uh, it's a bit of a tiny screenshot, probably hard to see. Um, Basically, this is a list. Up top, it's a list of the services in your application. Um, at, to at the top, the first two are already running. The third one, the container is being created. The other ones are pending. Uh, and then at the bottom, you have logs. And this is just one view. It's like you have a bunch of different views on the CLI. So you can have a separate view for logs and that kind of stuff. But let's not dwell too much on the CLI. This is what the dashboard looks like. Uh, this kind of looks like a chat room. But do not be mistaken. These are not your friends. They're your services. Do not trust them. <laughs> Um, so you can basically uh, have a whole a stream of all the logs from your whole cluster here, uh, sorry, a whole, your whole namespace of your application, uh, or you can click them individually and see the logs for just one. And like I said, I used to have Stern, uh, remember Stern, the log streamer? Uh, I used to have Stern running all the time uh, in a separate terminal where all my logs would go to. Uh, and since I started using Tilt, I don't do that anymore because Tilt does just as good a job. Uh, so that is uh, basically this dashboard is why I stopped using Stern and I had been using Stern for a billion years before. Um, when there's an error somewhere, uh, it gives you an alert like that. So it's very easy to, to see when something went wrong. Uh, it gives you the exact error message that Kubernetes flagged as causing the error. So you don't have to play detective on Kubernetes when something goes wrong. You don't have to shell into a pod and go look at the logs and whatever. Makes, this makes it a lot easier to just see at a glance when, when, when things uh, misbehave. Uh, and this feature just came out. So these screenshots, uh, these two are pretty old. I took them like, I don't know, maybe early in the year, I think. Uh, and this one is recent. So it has a few things that the other ones doesn't. So if you look at the, at the part in the corner uh, where it says two minutes, uh, or there, I suppose, where it says two minutes, there's a little circly thing, which is a button you can click to manually rebuild and redeploy your service. Uh, and most importantly, if you look at the top, there's a create a snapshot button. Uh, and that is a new feature, and it's really cool, and a lot of people already love it. What it does is, uh, this whole dashboard is in your browser, uh, and it has the logs for every service, every build, every deploy, every error, everything. It has all of that. And what this feature does is, you click a button, it gets you a link, you can send that link to your teammate and they can open that on their browser and they're going to have a frozen in time snapshot of exactly what was running when you took the snapshot. So the way people use this is, uh, let's say I have 15 services in my application, one of them went wrong, I don't know who wrote that, I'm not familiar with that code, I can't even decipher that error message. I can just get a link for this, the current state of my cluster with all the logs, all the builds, all the errors, all of that. I can send that to my colleague, my colleague can then look at it and say, oh, uh, this is what happened, this is how we should fix it, or, you know, it's a problem with the other team, I'll let them know. So it's a really good way to share cluster state with your team members, uh, which up to now we were basically copying and pasting a bunch of shit on Slack, uh, which everyone always hated. So now you can just share the whole uh, context of your cluster at once, and that's really cool. All right, so we're done with Tilt for now, uh, and this is my favorite one in, in the whole talk. So yeah, this is the best. The, the word there is clusterfuck, by the way. Um, all right. So uh, let's start wrapping this up and let me see how much time I have. Um, okay. So, uh, tool chains. Uh, omnipresent, Helm and Kubectl. You will not escape Helm and Kubectl ever. I don't care what you're thinking. You just have to learn both of them and deal with them. That's it. Sorry. Uh, single purpose, it depends on what you're doing. So some of the functionality in this single purpose tools is already present, present on the tools in the next category. Some of it is not. So notably, uh, inlets is not, kube forward is not, telepresence, depending on what you're doing. Um, 
So if you want that functionality, you know you do. So you just investigate them and use them. Uh, if not, if you don't need those specific things, I'd suggest just using the next category, which I'm going to talk about last. So for debugging, Cube Forward basically uh, lets you inspect things, uh, inspect endpoints from your cluster, but uh, using your, your local host uh, to do it from which is handy, then you should use Squash if you like debuggers, and you should use uh, Stern if you like print line debugging, uh, which is fine. Uh, except if you're using Tilt, you don't really need Stern because the, the log in there is just perfect. Uh, okay, and now for the last category. You should not use Draft because it's dead. Uh, you should not use Jenkins X because it's basically scaffold wrapped up. You should not use scaffold because there's tilt, which does the same thing better. And then really it's between tilt and garden, which are the two companies that one I work from and the other I used to work for. So this is going to be awkward. You know, it's like talking about your ex to the current one or something, but you know. Um, so what I will say about them is that garden has more features. Uh, more features built in. And maybe you need them, maybe you don't. If you do need them, you're going to pay a cognitive cost because you need to learn them. And Garden uh, focuses, uh, let's say, it does a much better job on the engineering side than on the usability side. So it's going to take you uh, a bit to learn them. Um, and it can be brittle, it's not exactly extensible, but if the stuff that it does is, is exactly what you need, and so like in cluster building and a fancier dependency system and in cluster builds, that kind of stuff, uh, if that's exactly what you need, then just pay the cognitive cost and use that. Uh, while Tilt, uh, it's a lot better to use. It's a much better experience. Uh, I find, having worked at both companies, that developers in general prefer just the slick interface, something that they like. Um, it doesn't do as much, it doesn't have as many built-in features out of the box like that. Uh, but on the other hand, it, ha it uses Starlog for config, so it's a lot more extensible. So for example, we don't have in cluster builds with Tilt right now, but maybe we will in a couple weeks, because some crazy person is just going to write it. Uh, and we do have those uh, PRs coming in all the time. So Tilt is, uh, it, it's easier to use, uh, it's more flexible, and it's prettier. Basically, that's what I'm saying right now. Uh, and yeah, I, I usually would end this part with a clear recommendation, just use this, but because of this, uh, you know, awkward moment, I'm just going to say look at both and, and then use Tilt, but look at both first. <laughs> uh, and yeah. So the motivation for this talk, just a couple words on it, is because uh, it's a very convoluted ecosystem. I hope this helped bring some clarity into the development story of Kubernetes. Uh, I'm going to work harder on this next year. I'm preparing talks about actual workflows from those big companies that I mentioned, like what do they use to set up their config files, what do they use in terms of tilt or garden, what do they use for provisioning, uh, all of that. So I want to keep working on it because I think Kubernetes doesn't have to be hard. It's just hard because it's unknown right now. Uh, all right, so these are all the tools that uh, I talked about. Uh, I gave the slides to the, the conference person, so you can probably download all of this. If you want to take a picture, you can take a picture, but you don't actually have to. Uh, and this is how you can find me and talk to me, and uh, thank you. <laughs>